Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for frame rate is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Frame Rate is brought to you by Netflix. Watch thousands of TV episodes and movies streamed to your PC, Mac, or TV instantly. Plus, get DVDs by mail in about a business day. For your free 30-day trial, go to netflix.com slash twit. I'm Tom Barrett. I'm Brian Brushwood. Welcome back, Brian Brushwood. Hello, Tomas Marie. Should we have given a spoiler alert on that Portal 2 scene <laughs> at the beginning that of the show? Um, see, that's just it. Is that's not actually in Portal 2. That was uh, that was a hack that someone put together going on the Pop-Tart Cat, the Nyan Cat, N-Y-A-N. And since we had uh, somebody covering that on the guitar last a couple weeks ago, thought we'd go ahead and throw that in there. Oh, whew. See, I thought I had missed a part when I played through. And, no. and I missed the, because uh, I remember the special surprise, but I, I didn't remember seeing the Pop-Tart yet. But that's just it. Like that whole segment, spoiler alert, yellow. Uh, that whole, that whole, the whole joke is that there is no surprise at that moment. It's what? A little... Why did you have to spoil that? For... <sighs> what? What? Oh, the, now you ruined that, Portal like 2 a, for everyone. It's like a two, it's like a two second thing. It's like a two, I didn't ruin it. It's also anything. like one of the things you're like, there's not going to be a surprise. I, I've played, I've played Portal. I know how the, yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the most... Yeah, I, I ruined, I ruined, like, the worst joke in the whole thing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right. All right. Uh, well, let's uh, not tarry, shall we? Indeed. I watched sir. the Royal Wedding last weekend, so I'm, I'm full of words like that. You uh, watched the Royal Wedding? What is wrong with you? I don't even know you anymore. Oh, you know why? Because we, uh, we flew into Honolulu on uh, Thursday night, and we get... Uh, we got delayed an hour and a half. We get to the hotel room. We walk in. We turn on the television, and right then... Kate Middleton is getting in the car to drive to the church. And we were just like, well, frick, we're sucked in now. Oh, my gosh. Like, what, what does a grown man feel for watching pretend aristocrats hold on to a dying tradition that serves no purpose? Well, first the of all, they are the only legitimate monarchy this country has. And we were illegally separated from them, from them by an unrecognized revolution. Uh, and so King George was mad when he signed the recognition of the separation of the colonies. And so I believe that uh, we are still in a state of revolt. I don't even know you anymore. Pandering to our, to our friends across the pond. I'm ready to get things started. Let's sir. do the big story. <laughs> this just in the big story. Pandemonium, my friends, pandemonium. People are not buying televisions anymore. Told you. Nielsen uh, reporting that, check this out, used to be, used to be, Brian, last time they checked, 98.9% .9 of American households owned a television set. Do you know what that percentage has plummeted to, Brian? Um, I bet that the number of non-television owners has tripled to a staggering 3%. 96.7% now, down from 989 
Uh, you know what? Uh, here's what I thought was interesting is this is one of those Rorschach stories where you can read into it whatever you want. Someone like me reads like, aha, we're all cutting the cords. Whereas other people uh, read it as, you know, oh, the economic downturn is so severe, people can't even afford a television anymore. Right. Which and then the New York Times puts a picture of televisions in a dumpster being hauled away by a you know, forklift. Right? Yeah. It just gives you the impression everyone's just tossing away their televisions. It's really hard for me, especially in that story they're talking about, like, you know, these, these poor, poor people who, who are confused and destroyed by the switch to digital from analog and who, who will care for these individuals. And it's like, I, I don't, I mean, how, however little money you have, I mean, the government paid to give you 50 bucks. They give you 50 bucks for, there were people who were making money on the government uh, reimbursements for, for, for the tuners. Is it, is it really that big a deal? Well, actually, it was, it was difficult for some legitimate folks who needed them to find them because there was a limited number of cards. Uh, and so, so people who didn't need them applied and got the cards, and then they ran out, and then there was a long delay. It was a pretty confusing process. To be, well, I'm not saying frank. it wasn't a stupid process, but but uh, to hear them read it, it's like these poor, poor people can't afford to watch the magic box anymore. And I I, I don't know. It just seemed a little bit. Um, I mean, maybe I just well, haven't met any of these poor people. Well, the and, Niel the Nielsen uh, the Nielsen uh, report s suggested there were two reasons for the for the drop because we haven't had a drop like this since 1992. And in 1992, the reason for the drop was the recession. Uh, people just decided they you know when their TV busted. They, it wasn't worth it to pay for a new one, and so they didn't bother buying a new one. And so you see that this you see that this time around, it, the digital TV transition I think is a little bit of a red herring in there. I think it's more folks who are out of work, struggling, saying, "Gosh, you know what? I can. I, I it's going to be really costly for me to replace that television. Forget it. I'm not going to do that." I think there's a certain amount of people doing that. And then the other part of it they suggested were folks who are moving in for the first time entry-level jobs, people out of college, people out of high school deciding, you know, I'd rather spend my money on a smartphone uh, and, and, or, or a computer, or laptop, and, and get my entertainment that way than spend a bunch of money on a, on a television. So when I was in college, it was sort of the, the deal was like, oh, when you get out of college, do you get cable TV or not? And I didn't get cable TV for a long time. I was like, I'll just save my money, do other things. And I, I think this is the modern equivalent of that, which is, you know what? I'm not going to even buy a television because I can do so much on my computer and on my laptop. Why would I, why would I waste money on that? Uh, you know what? My entire time that I was in college, or at least the first two years of college, I, I didn't have a TV in my room. I didn't own it or bring a TV. I mean, I guess I could have brought one from, from my parents' house, but uh, I just wasn't interested because there was so much awesome. You're in freaking college. In fact, as I toured colleges, when I ask, you know, because we do frame rate, uh, I, of course, ask people, well, what do you watch? What are you into? I'm shocked at how few college students even know what's going on on television. Uh, and, and I was guilty of the same thing at that time. I don't think I got a television until my junior or senior year, and it was just because my roommate happened to have one. But even then, I didn't do cable. I just did. I remember watching uh, Star Trek The Next Generation every single night on KNVA at 1230 because, uh, you know, it was just whatever. That happened to be what was on. Over the air, yeah. I mean, that, that, that's the way I – until – Till we uh, plugged in uh, when we moved to a new house in Austin uh, and we found out that they had never turned off the cable from the previous recipients, um, I didn't have cable. Yeah. But I, I still didn't pay for it. I just had it. By but I mean, that's how it is. That, that's how it is when you're in college as well. A lot of these rooms, you get free cable. Uh, you just hook up your television to it in there. So I, I guess I'm not surprised. A big part of the article is talking about these young whippersnappers, these up and comers with their YouTubes and their Facebooks and their Netflix uh, on demands. Uh, but I'm with you. I, I, I actually don't think this is a new thing. I think that that maybe it's a growing thing. But because uh, I remember I was so into computers at the time that um, uh, that the Internet and video games was all I needed. I, I didn't even want TV when I was in college. Well, and you needed a television to play video games, right? Uh, you know, for for console games, you still do. Uh, yeah. You can use a monitor, but it's, you know, usually people think, oh, if I got an Xbox, I need a television. But now I think a lot of people are saying, you know what? I can play video games on my iPad. I can play video games on a smartphone. I can play video games on my laptop. Uh, why don't I save the money? It's become more compelling to not get a television than it used to be. And it's making Nielsen for the first time consider counting people watching television on their mobile devices as ratings. I think what? this is huge. 
What a novel idea that they should not. And you know what? Maybe next they'll come up with a brilliant idea that they shouldn't give people pen and paper to fill out and do the honor system to report what it is they watched. Maybe they can use this fantastic technology to pay attention to what people actually watch on their magic computer boxes. Well, what Nielsen does that with 5,000 families for their national ratings. They have, they have a, a detection system. Uh, that that actually can tell what's what's being watched, and they're trying to approve that all the time. It's only on the local networks that they still do the diary stuff. Uh, Arbitron does the diary stuff too. But Pat McDonough, who is the senior vice president for insights and analysis at Nielsen, uh, says we've been having conversations with clients. That would be a big change for this industry, and we'd be doing it in consultation with clients if we do it. But they they said the same sort of stuff before they started doing TiVo ratings, before they started including DVR ratings, and now that's standard. Uh, and the DVR plus three is usually uh, the rating that they pay attention to when they're evaluating how well a show does. Because that indicates whether or not people actually watch it. Watch like what, it. And I within think. a certain amount of time, so that if an advertiser said, I wanted to get my message out, they got it out within a window of time rather than a week or a month later. Uh, and I And to me, it's... It's obvious. Like, you know what? If I'm watching Fringe on Hulu, it should count as a rating, just like if I watched it on my DVR. What's the difference? Now, they should note that it's on Hulu because maybe there's different advertisements on Hulu, but that's no different than noting that I was watching it in Poughkeepsie versus watching it in Birmingham, Alabama. There's different local advertisements there, too. Uh, it's, just, it's just part of the campaign. They can figure this out. It's not an insolvable problem. Well, the, I guess right now the problem is is that as a percentage of total views of any kind of particular ad, uh, there are so few Hulu views, that was fun to say, that uh, that it makes it uh, difficult, to, it makes it not even worth it to track all of those. And that's why Hulu charges, you know, it's, it's its own ecosystem over there. But as Hulu grows to the point where there's a significant a number to add to the overall numbers, when all of a sudden Hulu is is a sizable percentage of possible overall ad revenue, then then I think we will see that transition to where uh, to where you buy all at once. They're like, well, do you want just over the air, or do you want more people to see it by going Hulu and over the air? Because obviously, from an advertiser's perspective, you get such a superior return on investment uh, on a per person basis with Hulu because number one, you know the ads actually being seen. There's ways to evaluate with interactive components to where you actually th th there are things you could do to you know where it's like would you rather watch the three minute ad right at the beginning or just see the you know, few 30 second spots and so on I, I got to imagine that as the hulu piece of the pie gets bigger advertisers are going to prefer the premier experience of the hulu ad revenue rather than just you know throwing it at a million viewers and see what happens all right let's move on to another big story Stop everything. It's another big story. There are some stories kicking around at the end of last week that Netflix is reducing illicit file sharing. Did you take a look at this uh, this analysis here? I took a look at it, but I didn't know necessarily what to think, especially since there were multiple studies that came back with different, uh, different results. It makes sense on the surface because uh, people don't tend to hoard material that they can get for free anytime they want. And uh, I know that was one of the arguments early on with MP3s. And, and once you saw all you can eat, uh, you know, buffets out there uh, that as far as I understood, there was a reduction in MP3 trading. Uh, but, uh, but I don't know. I mean, I don't know what to read from this since there's conflicting messages. How about you? According to Arbor Network's chief scientist, Craig Labovitz, P2P has fallen to a single digit percentage of North American network traffic down from the highs of over 30% in 2007. He says he thinks Netflix, iTunes, and direct download all play a role in the diminishing P2P traffic volumes. I think that's part of it. Uh, I think it's simp very simplistic to say Netflix. I think it has to, I mean, he's talking about overall P2P traffic. I think people doing streaming services aren't pirating MP3s as much as they did uh, before. I think the ability to go onto a Hulu or a Netflix means that, especially with video, where we only really want to watch it once. It's not like music where we want to hear it over and over and over again. It's, it's something where we don't want to bother going and looking up a torrent if we can get it easily. Uh, so like, like you, I think it's all logical. Uh, I think it's a big leap to say that this is the cause because there's also a lot of other ways people can go. They can use rapid share. Uh, they can do in-title searches on Google. Uh, they can use VPN traffic so you don't know that it's P2P that's being used. I mean, there's, there's all kinds of other ways to get things, uh, and that could also contribute to a fall of P2P.
Well, and there's a couple of things to remember. First of all, keep in mind that a lower percentage does not necessarily mean a reduction in people actually uh, using BitTor because you could have a static amount. It could be that all of these other guys increased 5, 10%, but BitTorrent remained largely flat. And as a result, it now has a lower share yeah, of right. all the traffic on the internet. Another thing to remember is that um, uh, look at look at these other players in there. When you're talking about, you know, look at how much YouTube has exploded as far as video pushing over the last over the last five years. I mean, if you're going to say net, Netflix, obviously Netflix has had more recent dramatic growth, but of course YouTube continues to grow at an exceptional rate. It's it's all of the internet is getting bigger. And this little slice of people who are stealing their movies, if they remain a very specific segment, for example, let's say, let's say every single college student from freshman through senior year does nothing but pirate movies, and they're the only people who does, and they continue to do this the whole thing. Meanwhile, as your grandmother starts to use Netflix, as your parents become hip to YouTube, the rest of the pie grows to a level that uh, that that one segment of pirates, the people who are unwilling to get real content at uh, you know at a, at a legal distribution, those are the people that become a smaller percentage of the overall pie. Uh, yeah, I think uh, we're going to see P2P fall continually, and uh, I think it's another data point that uh, a lot of times people would like to ignore when they're talking about the need to combat piracy. Uh, in fact, I think probably if you said this to somebody in the MPAA, they would say, that's right, because we have been campaigning to reduce piracy, and that's why P2P traffic is falling. I mean, and right. let's not ignore the fact that not all P2P traffic is piracy either, but I think there's better ways and other ways of getting content, both illicit and legal, uh, and and P two P is is I, I think you you nailed it. It's it's not falling necessarily. It's just the sh the internet is growing and its share of the internet may may continue to fall as people now, move on and try other things. I'll tell you uh, this this calls back to our discussion about uh, about convenience versus fidelity. This is a real life scenario where when there's a movie out on Netflix streaming. Uh, there, you still have the option, you know, legally or illegally, to grab that movie in a much higher resolution that will play consistently. That you don't have to worry about buffering or anything like that if you download the file. But it's very inconvenient to use BitTorrent. You got to go out and find it. You got to wait for it to download. You got to have the entire file before you can start playing with it. And I got to believe that this is a case where the convenience of Netflix can trump even the uh, the increased fidelity and the unbeatable price of piracy, which is good news. I mean, again, we, as we've said before. We're fans of seeing a legitimate media get out there. But, uh, but of course, we are very aware that a lot of people really do still pirate movies. All right. So we have people getting rid of their televisions. Uh, we have a fall in illicit file sharing, possibly, and, and, and maybe an effect because of, of legal streaming. What does this mean for good old-fashioned television viewing? That is yet another big story. Tuck in your bootstraps. It's yet another big story. Well, a TV executive uh, told a major Australian broadband conference that it's social media, gaming, and other online subscription services that are killing television. Everybody's um, got all this other stuff well, to do. He also points out that it's your fast cars, your jazz music, and all of you being on the damn lawn. You know, actually, I, I think this is a first example of a TV executive being honest and saying, okay, fine, you know what? It's not copyright infringement. That's not what's killing us. It's the fact that people have other things to do. They can yes. go on social networks. They can play video games. They can uh, subscribe to Netflix. And it's just competing with us. It doesn't mean people don't watch television anymore. It just means it slices it up into a lot of different, uh, different opportunities. And that's why I think our first story showed that people are buying televisions in fewer amounts. Because when you only have the resources to pick a couple of those opportunities you're probably going to pick the cheaper ones like social media and maybe an online subscription service, and then that's it. Well, and also think about it in terms, I, know, I remember it must have been a decade and a half ago, Wired Magazine did an article about uh, the amount of returns on investment you get for different types of media. And they found that far and away, the price to number of hours enjoyed, the best you could ever do is buy an MP3 because you got you would listen to it or an, an album, a CD album of uh, as well. You know, magazines were way worse because you spent five bucks and you only read it once. 
uh, think about the if you want to get the most out of your dollars, buy a video game because you you got 40, 60 hours of entertainment out of this one investment. And if you're looking at something like a, you know like an Angry Birds for three dollars, you get hours and hours and hours of entertainment. And as far as this guy making you know telling the truth, uh, look, it's great. I'm glad that he's speaking the truth. But I don't want to allow him as being a visionary of of you know realizing the way the wind's blowing. To me, it's like. How bad does it have to get outside? How obvious does it have to become to everyone that there are other choices before finally an industry executive will admit it in public? Yeah, I guess it is snowing. Uh, I guess I'll put on my coat. Okay, <laughs> right. fine. Let me let me get this door open. I You're a visionary. I, I can't seem to open the door because it's covered in snow. Um, give, no, give me I, I, I agree with you. I would definitely not laud or call this person a visionary, but I think, I think you know, sadly, it is true that um, he, he deserves a little props for being one of the first people to to go, wow, uh, it is snowing outside, you know? But I, I, I think the emperor doesn't have any clothes on. I, I really do. Absolutely, absolutely, and, and, and good on him for telling the truth. Now, wait, uh, before we get into uh, Film Foul and Tube Tops, uh, you, you know, this brings up a question, right? Uh, if people aren't watching television, if people are doing social networking, they're not, not buying televisions in, in greater amounts, how is this affecting the television networks and the cable companies? That is probably not such a big story since it's our fourth big story, but it is our next big story. Get ready. It's probably not such a big story since it's our fourth story and thus doesn't have a sounder. All right. A uh, couple of earnings reports came out at the end of last week. Discovery Communications. Uh, they're the folks who make uh, the uh, the Discovery Channel. They, make, uh, they, they do have some websites like How Stuff Works. Uh, Viacom, they're best known right now for suing YouTube, uh, but they also have the MTV Networks as well as successful uh, film industry with Paramount. And Time Warner Cable. We know Time Warner Cable. I mean, obviously, they're an Internet uh, company, but they also deliver cable television. How do you think these three companies are doing in the face of all of this other stuff we're talking about? is in the wave of the digital revolution, they are curled up in the corner, sucking their thumbs with just rivers of tears coming down off the, down their cheeks. My guess is they're totally hosed and hating life, right? Yeah, well, uh, well, and you know what? I think they are curled up in the corner, sucking their thumbs with tears coming out of their cheeks, but it's with laughter because Discovery Communications revenue is up 9%, profits up 20%, Viacom revenue up 20%, profits up 47%, and Time Warner Cable revenue up 5%, profits up 50%. Well, if there's one thing we've learned from the music industry, it's that when they're rolling in dough, they finally stop complaining about how everything's going to crap, right? So we can right. expect to be the end of them complaining about people not watching TV, right? No, right? I think we can expect more videos that say, you know, if you, uh, if you download an illegal movie, this woman gets killed. We just shoot her through the head. <laughs> you know, that, that's what it, or it, I, maybe, I'm, maybe I'm remembering that video wrong, but there was some video uh, like that. Uh, no, no. And what they'll do is they'll say, and you can tune in and watch this shooting live, pay-per-view, this Thursday, available yeah. on Time Order. So, okay, let's, let's, let's be fair. It is not fair to look at a company that is making revenue and say, and therefore they must rest on their laurels and just let everyone steal from them and undermine their business model. Granted, that is not fair. The way you continue to make money and be a successful company is being vigilant and fighting against threats. I get that. But I think... When they're trying to win us over to their side, when we're skeptical and saying, you know, we don't think the threat's that big and we think you can deal with it. And I bet there's other business models you could try. When they say, yeah, but we're poor. It's killing well, us. It's undermined. It, it's like, no, you're not. You know, here's, it's a, let's not exaggerate what the actual effects are. Now, in their defense, keep in mind that they're not really, when they say things like this out in public, they're not really necessarily talking to us. And they may not even mean what they say. These are publicly traded companies that have a board of directors. And do you want to be the guy that shrugs his shoulders and goes, eh, we're fine. Everything will be fine. Yeah, exactly. And it's like, these people, everybody's got to cover their ass. And so you get this weird this weird split personality where they're rolling in where they're raking in more money than ever and inwardly privately they all know they all know that they are content providers as long as they continue to create high quality content all the internet is doing is providing an even better way to distribute it to an even wider audience and make even more money but uh, nobody nobody can say that kind of thing out in public where they're going to get a phone call from the board of directors afterwards yeah and then that's the you, you hit on the key cuz i where i was going to go is saying but if there was a company 
that actually said, you know what, we're going to distribute our stuff online. We're going to compete with piracy. Uh, and we're, we're actually going to take advantage of the new technologies and try to use them to our advantage. Uh, then when they complained about the, the business undermining effects of copyright infringement, I might be more willing to listen because here's a company that's not just digging its heels in and saying we want to stop the Internet from working the way it works and stop all advancement. Uh, but if somebody were to go out and do that, that board of directors is going to call and say, what are you, crazy? You're going to do what? You're going to give what away on the Internet? You know, because the companies are too big to take those kind of risks. And that's the problem. That's, that's, that's the slow-moving bureaucracy that we're dealing with. Well, and actually, one of the stories we have later in Tube Tops speaks exactly to that. But uh, I don't know about you. I'm ready to, uh, I'm ready to go to the movies. See Let's, uh, let us uh, get there in just a moment. Uh, we, can, we can actually go to the movies in an easier way by thanking our sponsor. What? Yeah. Wait a minute. How, what's easier than getting in your car, driving five miles over to a movie theater, paying for a movie, sitting down and listening to people talk while laser pointers shoot at this and ruin the movie view? What's easier than that? Delivering movies directly to your home? Not possible. Yep. Uh, instantly watching thousands of TV episodes and movies streamed directly to your PC or Mac or on your TV via Xbox 360, PS3, or Nintendo Wii. No, it takes 30 minutes for me to get a pizza. How can somebody bring something to my door that fast? The That's not possible. What? Internet. The internet? Yeah. What? Internet. They, they could deliver movies over the internet now instantly? Yeah. Well, you can no. have, you can, uh, let's put it, let's be fair. You can get DVDs mailed to you in about a business day from Netflix, but you can also watch as many movies as you want anytime you want streaming live from their selection of online Wait. streaming. Oh, no, I know, I know how the internet works, but I don't have my computer hooked up to my big screen. I only have my Xbox 360. It's, and uh, it, Netflix it, is available on the Xbox 360, as I just mentioned. What? No. What, but what about my buddy's got a, a PlayStation? Could it, could it work on that one? Yep. In fact, even with the PlayStation Network down, uh, we've tested this out. Jason Howell was able to watch Netflix movies. What? Mm -hmm. This is a robust ability to watch. Now, I'll bet, I'll, bet, uh, I'll bet there's only like a few movies, though, right? There's not a ton of movies. There's no um, way they can... I don't know. Do you like uh, Raging Bull? Uh, yeah, that's, that's an amazing movie. Yeah, that's, you could watch that amazing. right now. No. Hearts in Atlantis? Oh, dude, I love that movie. That's tied into the Dark Tower series. Yeah, you, you can watch that right now. Harold and Maude? Uh, I don't even know what that movie is. That's Sid something and that Nancy? Would watch. Uh, yes, that's that's another, that's the duet. Gentlemen yes. Prefer Blondes? Never heard of it. Oh, come now. That's a classic. <laughs> oh, I, I know I know of it, but uh, don't look. Uh, uh, all kidding aside, you know that I am deeply, deeply in love. Bonnie is getting worried about how much I'm deeply in love with Netflix's jealous, instant huh? streaming. Yeah, And you know what's great about their instant streaming is you noticed that, that when they first opened, this is how far thinking they were. When they first opened, they didn't call it DVDs by mail, even though that's what they were doing. They said Netflix because these guys knew down the road you'd be able to watch thousands of movies instantly on your uh, computer, your iPad, your iPhone. Yeah, I, I was watching it on my iPhone the other day. I couldn't believe it. Right over the 3G. Anyway, you don't have to believe a word we're saying. You don't even have to care about what we're saying. But if you would like to express your support for frame rate and watch some free movies, sign up for a 14-day free trial at netflix.com slash twit, and you will have done both those things. Wow. Doesn't even cost you anything. Nope. What's your not, excuse, jerk? Not a thing. I don't know what your problem is. And uh, now we're going to tell you about all kinds of cool movies in Film Falm. I can't do the voice again this week. I Why just not? can't think of anything to say. And you're going to have to let me have a go at that sometime. Oh, you should. Yeah, knock yourself I'll do out. it like a black exploitation film or a grindhouse trailer. Nice. You know, well, like, but that's the wrong move. That's the wrong music for a grindhouse trailer, isn't it? Maybe, we'll, maybe we should we need, change We need it. versions. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, uh, no, I'm down, I'm down for that film for sure. Film film genre versions. Yes. Yes. I love it. You guys can send it in to frameratereshow at gmail.com. That's where all of our awesome stuff comes from is from you guys. Variety reports that Ubisoft, the game studio behind Assassin's Creed... Uh, and Prince of Persia titles is launching Ubisoft Motion Pictures for the purpose of turning game franchises into TV and movie franchises. Because, you know, they're always so good. Uh, yes. Well, and what's funny is uh, last year, this is this is something that I noticed. I'm actually going to look it up right now. Prince of Persia uh, made about $100 million last year because it was on one of my movies in the Summer Draft League. The Tomatometer at RottenTomatoes.com has Prince of Persia at 36%. 
positive reviews. Almost everyone hated it. Get this. It made a mint, made over $300 million. And do you realize it is one of the top three highest uh, highest rated as far as um, reviews go? It is one of, this is 36% positive reviews and it is one of the most positively reviewed video game movies of all time wow is I, that insane i yeah i i if i can hope for but one thing it is that this partnership of ubisoft's with the movie uh industry will make better movie games games out uh, of movies movies out of games yes well and, and the problem is is everybody thinks because it's a different medium that you need to change the story to adapt to the new medium but as we're seeing with game of thrones when you keep true to the original source material, something magical and amazing happens. And, and they are changing things for the media. They are. I mean, there, there are certain things we've talked about them. There are certain things you have to adapt to. But I think sometimes that's used as a crutch. Where it's like, we don't have to change story. everything. Right, exactly. And, and people, be, you know, yes, we do want to see some things different. Uh, we want to see uh, an expression. For example, you know, you don't have to show an entire movie from a first-person perspective with grunts and stim packs as you, as you walk around. But you could tell the, the exact same, uh, the, the core of what you loved about the video game could and should show up in the movie. And so rarely does that actually happen. But meanwhile, this thing's making a mint smart decision on, on Ubisoft's, uh, from where they're standing. Because it's like, doesn't need to be any better. They've already got the name, they got the title, they got the license. Who cares if the movie's good or not? Because even when they're bad, they still make a mint. All right, now by the time most of you watch or listen to Frame Rate, you'll probably already know the answer to this, but StarWars.com has a countdown up because on May the 4th, it's become common for people to, you know, make Star Wars jokes. May the 4th be with you. Right? Yeah. 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 So they're taking advantage of that and saying on May the 4th, all will be revealed. Visit May the 4th dot Star Wars dot com at 6 a.m. Pacific time. And there's a countdown on the page and on Star Wars dot com's front page. There's a Blu-ray disc logo next to it. Well, that's not a giveaway, is it? Uh, well, that bums me out because the one thing that could actually make me happy, the one thing I don't want to see and that we're probably going to get is another re-release of the same content with a minor variation in a new format so that we can all buy the White Album again. That's uh, supposedly be, coming September 16th. So what's what, this going to be? Well, what would be awesome, and especially with the tagline, all will be revealed, would be if it was some unannounced, like quietly they had put together some kind of awesome documentary with never before seen behind the scenes telling the story of, of you know, any of the movies or, or, or whatever. That would be awesome if it was all new content. However, I am strongly... Um, I'm, I'm strongly suspicious of that. And in the chat room, Adam12, who knows a lot about this stuff, uh, says this will be the packaging info, Ace Detect and Scam School Brian. I wonder if he means um, yeah. uh, to reveal what the package will be. This will be the details on what you can buy and what it'll look like, what will be included, all of that stuff. I think he's probably right. Um, That's a bummer. Hopefully there'll be an option with Blu-ray to have Han shoot first if you want to. <laughs> It'll pause the movie. Yeah. And it's like, it's like a choose up, your own adventure. What do you think? Yes. That would be awesome. You could undo changes. All right. Uh, some video providers have been blocking Google TV, taking their films off Roku. Uh, Netflix uh, still haven't, hasn't released a movie streaming app on Android. But the Epics channel is following a big on any screen marketing campaign and rolling That's out awesome. apps on a ton of new devices, including Android tablets from HTC, LG, and Motorola, uh, Samsung TVs and Blu-ray players, and Roku. Uh, that is great. As, as we've said before, that's, that's good news all the way around. And, you know, I guess thank, thank goodness for the success of the iPad that makes people, forces them to look at uh, different distributions, where it's like, you know, in order to cash in, you got to step outside your comfort zone. Also, we've got a new trailer this week from Tarsim Singh's Immortals, and uh, io9 calls it the Sistine Chapel on steroids. Hey, can we take a look at it? I watched it earlier, but I would love to watch it. Yeah, again. did you watch this? It's it's yes. pretty pretty crazy looking. I have plenty of women. I have plenty of weapons. I have moved every precious stone. People worship upon my mark will be left on this world forever. No! The Heraclean King Hyperion has declared war on all of humanity. If 
any of you influence the affairs of mankind, the punishment will be severe. If there is one human who could lead them against Hyperion, it would be Theseus. may be on your side, but your dream has just begun. To those who much is given, much is lost. Today, we are offered something we would never have. Today, we fight for honor. Fight for your future. Fight for your children. Cause chose well. Nice shot. <laughs> all right, I'll tell you this one. Two things, all right. And the first one's positive about it. Uh, the uh, that arrow, that that it's a bow where it's like you pull back and an arrow instantly appears. Do you automatically think of the ranger from the old Dungeons and Dragons Saturday morning cartoon? Oh no, I hadn't. But you're right. Yeah, but you know what I'm talking about, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, and yeah. How awesome! I, I mean, that thing alone will be fun to watch. But but man, am I tired of? I mean, first of all, this looks beautiful, and who knows if it'll be good or bad or not? It certainly is is gorgeous, and it's a neat idea. But uh, the entire trailer, that's the second time I watched it, and I never once believed that anything was farther than five feet behind him. It's this, this I, was, I was actually all into it until he started shouting, and then it just sounded and looked like every other Greek movie I've ever seen. And the yeah. problem is it looks like to me like Clash of the Titans, which ended up being a dud, uh, and, and uh, at least Clash of the Titans was a remake of a classic movie. This is not. Uh, well, no. Uh, hey, man, in, in favor, in the great debate between remakes or something new, I'm always voting for something new. Okay. So it's like yeah, you know, already on the side of, you know, Go Immortals instead of Clash of the Titans, which, by the way, even though critically it was a dud, uh, it was financially made a, made a mint. And in fact, they're, I believe they're doing Clash of the Titans 2 now. Oh, yeah, I'm sure they are. <laughs> Sorry. Clash of the Titans, even more Titans. Uh, Ender's Game has a distributor. Uh, this is the book by Orson Scott Card. They're going to make a movie out of it. And the distributor is Summit Entertainment, makers of Twilight. Uh, uh, well, uh, yeah. you know what? I can't even think. I'm, I'm so excited. It's short-circuiting my, my sarcasm joke filter. Like, I, I, for over a decade, have been following the news on the Ender's Game stuff. I don't know if you remember, but back in the late 90s, uh, Orson Scott, Scott Card actually full-on published his intended treatment for the Ender's Game movie. And it got, he got so many complaints from people about how he should have done this or should have some, done that. He took it down and about six months later put up just the first, like, 20 pages of it instead. And that got much better reviews. People were much more excited about it. Uh, I, this movie deserves to be awesome. This story is awesome. Orson Scott Card's work is legendary. And it, especially for someone like me, I think how many sci-fi kids out there had, were 12 when they read Ender's Game. And it was one of those transformative, awesome experiences in sci-fi. It got them hooked forever onward. Uh, I really liked seeing some good talent and some good money behind this. We were talking about this on the Sword and Laser. Uh, one of the issues is going to be, do you leave the kids at, as eight years old with the amount of violence and then do you tone down the violence or do you make the kids older or do you tell the story true? And since it's Summit Entertainment, that question becomes more pointed to me because they make movies that target a young audience. And if they were going to make an R-rated movie, it wouldn't maybe be as big of a deal. But if they're going to try to make this PG-13, I don't know that they can get away with some of the scenes from Ender's Game with an eight-year-old. I don't know that they need to certainly not make it R uh, and even maybe not even make it PG-13. I'll tell you what will be will tell the tale is I want to see what they do with Super 8. If Super 8 has gritty or darker moments in it, because, you know, obviously the main characters are kids in that. If they can get away with kind of darkening things up a little bit, if we can get closer to Gremlins territory on here, I think I think they'll be fine for the content because, of course, there's no language issues uh, in the in the violence. It's only it's you know the violence is either spaceships blowing up or kid on kid violence you know physical punching or whatever. 
All right, let's check in uh, with the summer movie draft that's been going on. Uh, this this week, uh, we finally get a movie that is not owned by Brian. Uh, last week, we had our first double because Justin Robert Young of NSFW show fame had prom, which made $4.7 million. Uh, but Brian, you got Fast Five, $86.1 million. Pretty nice. How's it feel? I like to call it the hand of God that pulled me back into the game. Because as you know, all my first four movies all underperformed industry expectations. And of course, you could go to draft.nsfwshow.com slash hsx and you'll see the current Hollywood Stock Exchange. The good news is that uh, Fast Five uh, beat industry expectations. It became the largest opening in April and, and ever, I think, uh, with 80, 83, 86 million now. Um, the question is whether or not I have a chance or not is all based on whether or not the public goes to Thor next week or if uh, or if only the comic book fans go to Thor. Right. I th- Thor is going to do extremely well. They've been advertising the heck out of it for three months now. I think Thor is probably going to knock Fast Five down, and then I'm going to be out. But if Thor doesn't do well, then people got to go see a movie, and they're going to go see Fast Five. If I can get another strong weekend, then I got a chance back at the title. But I believe right now, according to the Hollywood Stock Exchange projections, you are slated to beat me with the number two position. Sarah Lane Rocks is still number one. Right, and Sarah's uh, test is coming up in a couple weeks. Priest... And bridesmaids uh, will be will be on. And in fact, the Tuesday after that weekend, uh, which would be what May sixteenth, I think, uh, I will be out of town. I'll be off on vacation, and so Sarah's going to co-host Frame Rate and uh, and do a post mortem on how well she's doing. Because then we'll actually have some serious numbers. You'll have had a bunch of movies. Justin Robert Young will have had two, and Sarah will have had two, and we'll be going into Jason Howell's first weekend with Pirates of the Caribbean. After that. Uh, so here's a weird wild card. I uh, obviously, if you've been living under a rock, then you probably haven't heard that uh, that uh, the U.S. finally, you know, captured or killed Osama bin Laden. What? Uh, and the, yes, apparently, apparently, uh, and of course, oh, yes. Wait, oh, I know. They, they, wait, they captured who? Uh, Osama bin Laden. Oh, right. Yeah, I did hear that. Okay, <laughs> I thought you said Larry the Cable Guy. <laughs> I thought you said somebody else, Sim- uh, diff- similar name, different guy. But I'll tell you what, uh, and this is what this is what a selfish idiot I am. I turn on the news and CNN shows giant throngs of people outside the White House shouting USA, USA, and I just all I can think of is I am so glad that I own Captain America <laughs> because I wonder if there's going to be a post Osama bump in patriotism. That'll, that'll that's so funny. Every Democrat in the country was sitting there like, "This is going to mean huge poll numbers for Obama in the reelection," and you're sitting there going, "This is going to mean huge numbers for me with Captain America." That's right. <laughs> but keep in mind, you know, because everybody played at home. I tweeted that out, and Crash Kincaid was just like, "Oh, thank goodness, that's in my roster too." <laughs> that's awesome. Uh, yeah. All right, do you have anything you've been uh, watching before we move on? Um, I didn't see any movies this week, so I got, yes. I got nothing. I, I mean, did watch as- Tron Legacy with the sound off while I listened to an audio book on a plane. That's as close I'll tell as you I got. If Tron, like I've always said this about the original Tron, original Tron, one of the best movies to watch with no audio, one of the worst movies to give your full attention to. So I would not be surprised if the exact same thing is true about Tron Legacy, except for that whole middle third where it's nothing but people drinking space wine at a table. That's actually kind of fun. Yeah, you know, the the bar was cool looking. It was less annoying when you didn't have to hear him talk. Yeah, all right. Uh, so that it? That's all you yep, got? that's it. That's it on the movies. Let's move on to Tube Tops then. <laughs> io9 has the fall TV update as we head towards the upfronts. The upfronts, if you don't know, are where the television networks get uh, a bunch of uh, buyers together and try to sell them ads ahead of time. This is where they lock up their, their money. For the rest of the year. So they this is where they'll premiere new shows. They'll pimp the ratings of the shows they have. Uh, and it looks like we're going to be getting uh, some interesting looks at some fantasy type stuff. It's mostly mystical, though, not really uh, science fiction or fantasy. Everybody's looking to capture that uh, that lost lightning in a bottle again, which what's interesting is after as hard as we here on frame rate has have campaigned for fringe to be saved. Turns out that fringe being saved may screw over a lot of really interesting looking other projects. Yeah. So lock and key uh, is uh, is a, a production of Stephen King's son, Joe Hill, who wrote the uh, comic book mystery series that inspired this show. Uh, the plot uh, is essentially, uh, uh, well, where, where is the plot? Uh, um, it, 
It's a it's couple a of dra dramatic, riveting puzzle box ah, of a series. Three siblings and their mother move into their murdered father's family home where they discover a series of supernatural keys which give them extraordinary abilities, and then they go fight crime or they solve mysteries. Uh, but it looks like they might not uh, go with this because Fringe is successful. Also, J.J. Abrams' own Alcatraz, which they've shot a pilot for, uh, might be held off as well because... They have Fringe, and they're like, ah, we, we won't burn any bridges with J.J. We've renewed Fringe. Yeah, that's that's the downside. Uh, I would like to confirm for the chat room, people are asking if whether or not Cape 2, the belt, is on that roster, and apparently it is not, unfortunately. Touch is another Fox show uh, that, that, that they're saying might have a better chance, actually, of being picked up. Uh, the uh, Daily Beast likened this pilot script to Kring's uh, earlier Heroes, because this is done by Tim Kring and Kiefer Sutherland. Uh, with sweeping global plots, characters from all around the world. Uh, it's an ambitious show, um, but, you know, it's it's one of those comic book type movies. Uh, CBS has Person of Interest. Um, it's like The Prisoner, essentially. Uh, te a, a team of Michael Emerson from Lost uh, teams up with Jim Caviezel and uh, try to prevent crimes before they happen. Never heard of that plot before. Yeah. Never seen that anywhere. I know. Uh, NBC has Wonder Woman. Where Where are you at on Wonder Woman right now? I'm cautiously optimistic. I, I, are you even optimistic? Like in your gut, does, is there any part of you? Now, are you? Hopeful I'm cautiously ho hopeful. I think hope. I think you're right. I think I'm okay. hopeful. <laughs> I'm not really optimistic anymore. I'm hopeful. Uh, yeah, I don't. And, and can, uh, I got to be honest. I I think. They showed the costume, and everybody has snapped judgment, and there's no way to get past it now. Yeah. I don't. Everybody's given up before they've seen or heard anything about it. NBC also has 17th Precinct about detectives solving magical crimes, uh, starring uh, the very good uh, Doctor Bashir from uh, Battlestar Galactica. What's the guy's? Wait. What's the actor's name? Uh, did you say Doctor Bashir? Yeah, because he looks like Bash Julian Bashir from Deep Space Nine. I, I don't know. I'm looking at his face and I can't. Oh, think. Baltar was his character on Battlestar oh, Galactica. Baltar. Yeah. I guess I, I guess I don't recognize him with the with the short hair. Yeah, of course that's Baltar. Now that I see him, uh, but, but looks... also this is just Dresden Files all over again. Oh, is it? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. But it is Ron Moore. Hey, dude, I'm glad to see anything from Ronald D. Moore, and I seriously hope. I don't know that there's any chance he'll do it again. But how great was the every single week getting a live director's commentary for every episode of Battlestar Galactica when it came out on the Battlestar Galactica podcast. I would, watch the show, I would watch the show in the evening, and then the next day when I was out for a run, I would listen to the show again with Ronald D. Moore talking about it. And oh, gave yeah. Insights. Uh, NBC also has Grimm, which is a police procedural about fairy tales, um, and R.E.M., a uh, cop gets in a traffic accident, uh, in one dimension, his wife died in the car crash, leaving him alone to raise his son. In another reality, uh, the son died, and his wife and he struggle with the loss of their child. And so they twist those two stories together and uh, kind of question the nature of reality and dreams. It's kind of an, in not an Inception ripoff, but I think it's playing on that. Does does he get to flip between the two realities, I assume? Or? I think it's trying to guess which reality is real, you know, that sort of thing. Hmm. My favorite of the bunch, ABC's <laughs> Poe. Edgar Allan Poe is a crime-fighting poet in the 1840s. Uh, I just want, I just want to see him look at the corpse and just say, "Nevermore, bitch." I <laughs> kind of the taglines for this kind of thing. I don't know where they're gonna go with. I don't know why you're knocking, knocking, knocking at my chamber door. <laughs> uh, Once upon a time is another fairy tale series uh, with uh, classic Disney characters like Snow White uh, and other famous fairy folk crammed together in a village. Described as lost meets pushing daisies. Uh, okay. That sounds like two buzzwords that somebody put together. Uh, then we've got, what, The River, uh, documentary-style series taking place on the Amazon, uh, Desperate Housewives creator Mark Cherry doing Hallelujah, set in a Tennessee small town, lives being ripped apart by a battle between good and evil. Seems like a network version of True Blood to me. Uh, and then uh, the CW going after the Vampire Diaries crowd with a show called The Secret Circle based on the series by L.J. Smith. Heavenly, uh, a mystical drama about a crew of angelic lawyers. <laughs> Let's not...
to love. <laughs> Dude, I could, that could actually be awesome. A, 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 a court procedural that takes place on judging people if they should go to heaven or hell would be awesome. And finally, CW scary. has Awakening, uh, an odd zombie drama starring Titus Welliver, who was known as the Man in Black on Lost. Uh, some undead are in sort of a pre-dead situation, and they live separately from other people, and it's a fight for their rights. That sounds pretty good. What do you think? I mean, this is a great time to be a geek who's into fantasy and sci-fi, but is it, do you think it's going to be weird for kids growing up in this? Like, like think of how we felt about the boring crap our, tele, our, our parents watched on television. It kind of kills me that 20 years from now, that's how my kids are going to think about me watching Game of Thrones and stuff. Yeah, right. Well, you know what? There's not a lot of sci-fi, if you notice. There's no sci-fi in this list. It's, I, it's all mystical. mystical. It's, it's all yeah. fantasy. Uh, and 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 uh, and sort of you know some comic book stuff thrown in, but that that's what we're looking at. And Edgar Allan Poe, and of course Edgar Allan Poe as a crime fighting poet in the 1840s, which is my favorite for the fall season. Uh, Japanese broadcaster NHK uh, has been testing 8K resolution TV, and uh, they did their second test with a global transmission. They did their first test back in September, so now they've got 8K transmissions globally. That just you know so. Another marker on the road to better looking uh, stuff. Yeah. Now, uh, uh, when you go to the movie theater, those are 4K projectors, right? right. And 8K is a bigger number than 4K. Yes. And the, the yes, way it they is. say it is we're talking about four 1080p thingies side by side by side, right? I so, believe that is correct. Yes. Uh, that is, that sounds excessive and insane and stupid until. I remember back to watching Total Recall where they had photorealistic backgrounds that just snapped on. And, of course, then I thought, oh, well, then 8K will be awesome if I could tune to different channels and have walls that magically turn into windows to other worlds. Did you ever watch Torchwood, the Doctor Who uh, spinoff? I still have not seen it, but I know there's a lot of buzz going on with Torchwood. What's going on? Well, it's it's left. Uh, it's coming to stars now, uh, and it still has Russell T. Davis in charge of it. Uh, Russell T. Davies is no longer in charge of Doctor Who. Stephen Moffat is. Uh, so they've got a new trailer out for Torchwood Miracle Day, which is airing July 8th on Stars. Let's take a look. Now, when you say coming to Stars, does that mean that, that it's with the intention of being to an American audience? Or yeah, the no, it's, it, it is coming to Stars, yes. The American Stars on wow. July 8th. That's awesome, question mark? Let well, me take see. a look. Let me, let me see what you think. Once it plays. Stupid trailer. We're going to reload it and see if that makes it play. Because mm -hmm. it might. Sometimes it does. So far, it looks like I'm staring at myself. Okay, check it, check it out. Check it out. Check it out. In a much bigger story, Breaking Live. Made a chance comment that it hadn't recorded a single death. Not one person in the United States. It's not just America. It's worldwide. No fatalities have been reported. No one has died. Not a single death. Miracle. Miracle. Miracle Day. That's what this is being called. Miracle Day. Okay, that's an awesome premise. I'm already into it. This is perfect. This is perfect because I haven't watched any Torchwood. I don't feel like I need to know the backstory. I feel like I know everything I got to know, and I can dive face first into this. This looks like an awesome idea. Well, and I think that's what's brilliant about it is they, they give, it, give you uh, a little bit of the classic Torchwood theme there at the end. To kind of, uh, to me, that indicates you're going to have the characters you're familiar with, at least the ones that are still around. You know, there's going to be elements of this that, you know, John Barrowman's going to be there. Don't worry. Uh, but it's in a totally different situation that you can start with from ground zero. I'm sure there'll be allusions to Doctor Who. I'm sure there'll be allusions to the previous Torchwood series. But it's a it's a brand new premise that, yeah, I think you're right. It'll It'll That's suck people in because it's not... Torchwood, we're a secret agency protecting the Earth from aliens. It's Torchwood, nobody died. Now what? You know, they're going on the, on the plot line. They're promoting the plot line. And that's the way it should be. And, in fact, that's, that's how I fell off of the Doctor Who bandwagon because when it first started with the, when they relaunched it with Christopher Eccleston, I was watching all the episodes, but at some point I, I got behind and there was just enough of an order to everything that I didn't want to jump in again later. I still haven't caught up, like three, three seasons later. Uh, and whereas this is like it's, it's outright forgiving you, kind of like we saw with the promotion for, for Fringe, where it's just like doesn't matter what you do or don't know, this is a story and go. Yeah. Have you you haven't started watching Fringe yet though? Because the season finale is this weekend. Uh, no, and I'm told like I, I'm amazed. I was going through the emails over and in the chat room and on the tweets. Everybody's saying like, okay, 
done screwing around. Brian needs to watch Fringe and get caught up. Yeah, and so it's that- only gotten better. There was an episode called LSD that was just freaking amazing. It did some rotoscoping stuff. It had Leonard it's Nimoy in it. Uh, it was freaking brilliant. It was, it was a trip. It was a trip. Dude. That's, that's, uh, that's all- Comcast that's is the first with video on demand from all four major networks. Uh, still negotiating for early release of movies, but that's a notable thing, I guess. Good news, good news, good news. And good a- also good news, HBO Go hits iOS and Android and is free for subscribers. I've been using it on Google TV. In fact, <laughs> my direct TV box wasn't communicating from the bedroom to the living room, so I couldn't watch Game of Thrones in the bedroom. By golly, I wasn't going to get up off my bed and walk all the way into the other room to watch it. I turned on my Google TV and watched it on HBO Go. So I saw that. It said HBO Go free for subscribers. So I downloaded the app. It said HBO Go. And it said it's free for subscribers. And I was like, well, I'm a subscriber. And then I hit go. And it's like, what company are you with? And I'm like, Tom Warner. He's like, hey, no, sorry. Yeah, I, I know that pain. It used to be me because DirecTV was lagging behind for a long time, too. I don't know what the deal with Time Warner and HBO are. Oh, it is, yeah. Aren't they, aren't they close? Didn't they used to be part of the same company or something? You know, I, I almost wonder if this has to do with the Time Warner iPad app, if there's some kind of pissing match going on, because uh, Time Warner annoyed a lot of the channels by uh, by offering, you know, like, you know, hey, use your uh, iPad. Maybe. So there, hmm. there's probably some kind of legal negotiation going on there. Possibly, possibly. Although HBO wasn't one of those channels they were offering, I don't think. No, no, but I got to imagine that that certainly plays into it. All right, uh, let us move on to our web video spot, Interferon. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. What, what, what? Wait. Oh, oh, stop. Come on, stop. Come back, stop. Back. Come back, come back. My fault. I, I forgot to ask what you were watching. <laughs> I'm watching Game of Thrones over and over and over oh, again. Oh, my God, I can't believe I forgot that. Okay, yes. So with three <laughs> episodes in, by the way, third episode in the U.S., higher ratings than the first two That's that never happens a good thing yeah uh okay let me just say one thing um number one i did the audiobooks for uh, uh spoiler alert yellow you want to say that okay yes yeah, spoiler alert yellow we are going we, to spoil things we're not going to spoil the entire series but we're going to talk about the freaking episode uh in uh, <laughs> Uh, when I did Game of Thrones, I did the audiobook, and Roy Dotrice always read the name as uh, P-E-T-Y-R. He read it as Petire Baelish. So after hours and weeks of times hearing it, it was very off-putting for me to hear uh, Littlefinger referred to as Peter Baelish. But uh, the whole time I'm like, man, for some reason, uh, Peter Baelish is, is like way more, you know, in charming. I, I always thought of him as being way creepier and, and way way slimier and then uh, just robert young today pointed out like uh, maybe it's because that's thomas carchetti from the wire and i was like i had all these good feelings from oh him my his gosh i didn't i didn't put that together either uh i didn't either right but 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 then i'm like well of course i think he's great yeah <laughs> but uh man, I, put, I couldn't be happier and again all of the little niggling differences all of those are are to the good they're telling the story and they're telling it right and i was grinning ear to ear with the last scene with the water dancing with 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 aria so uh, aria's how, aria's my favorite character as i may have mentioned oh, before how great is the casting i mean she she looks like aria and she's adorable and she's going to grow into be such a beautiful young lady and she's got the attitude of aria and serio was fantastic too showing her showing her how to dance that's i i didn't picture him looking exactly like that but that is exactly how i pictured him acting it, it, that is the spirit of it and that is the that magic moment of realizing what this is and who set this up and what was happening uh, i'm just just giddy giddy about it i'm also very happy with with seeing what they're doing uh, over on the Dothraki side of things, uh, you know, showing the relationships coming together. Right, and, and also- our speculation that the way they started it being wrong was just an easier way for them to get it right has turned out to be true. Yes, yes, and, and they are doing it right, and certainly watching Daenerys and her brother's relationship uh, change, uh, like that moment, they handled it so well when, when Daenerys was, uh, gave a command and there was, they had to decide who to obey, and it was unanimous what side they were oh, on. Oh, yeah, we know where that's going. Yeah, no, that would be fantastic. spoiler alert red, but <laughs> never mind. But, but we can we can give a wink and a nod and still be in yellow yeah, territory. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so uh, I watched uh, part two of Doctor Who this weekend, uh, which I, I may have mentioned on the show that part one had some interesting stuff to it. I'm not going to get very spoilery about it. Uh, the, it turns out that the big surprise at the beginning of of part one is going to be a season long, series long. Plot. We're not going to find out what really happened there or what the cause of it is yet. Hmm. They're going to string us out for a while. But part two was fun nonetheless. 
Uh, I, I thought they did a great job. Uh, I was really happy to see the doctor and Amy uh, kicking around, and they introduced a couple of new plot elements, uh, a couple of new mysteries to carry on through the rest of the series as well. So it's going to be a good season. Good. I'm glad to hear that. All right. Now we can move on to Interferon. Brian, do you use Plex? Never heard of Plex. Plex is like XBMC or Boxy, which is a, a variant of XBMC. Uh, Plex oh, allows wait, you... To real quick, real quick. Time out, time out, time out. Picture, picture any of our parents just listen to that last statement that you just made. Like, like literally, how much has the world changed? They're like, Plex, it's kind of like XBMC or maybe Boxy. Yeah. I know. Well, I was, I was going to follow that up by explaining what it does. Just for those of you <laughs> out there who are like, I don't know what those things are. Um, I can make up words too, you know. Yeah. Uh, Plex is, is like DPMC with the overhead cam. And uh, no, it, it allows you to stream your videos from a central server or a computer onto any device in the house. So XBMC, Xbox Media Center, allows you to take videos that might be sitting on your computer in the office and watch them on the Xbox uh, streaming from your computer to your television. That's what Plex does now. And it's uh, been added to Roku. So now if you have files and videos sitting on your computer, you can stream them over your home network using Plex to the Roku player. I, uh, I'll be curious to see how easy it is because I know like I even had XVMC installed on my Apple TV for a while, but uh, never really used it because it was just just frustrating enough to, to work with. Whereas uh, the uh, play on is phenomenal. The fact that you just just everything is instantly available and it's in that unified Xbox format. So I, I'm always thrilled to see more options out there. All right, the Batman Complex. Uh, this is a, a, a viral video that's been kicking around the Internet uh, where someone decided to make a trailer for a purported film. Have you seen this? Uh, yeah, no, I was way early on this business. I loved it. Uh, well, this it looks, is, And this is a new version that he just put out. Oh, he put a new version out. Yeah, uh, so this is a if, little longer than the first one. Okay, well, if it's if it's like the one I saw, then he used footage from uh, Equilibrium, from uh, from the mechanic, uh, yeah, the machinist. Sorry, uh, the Equilibrium, the machinist. Of course, Batman Begins, The Dark Knight, uh, Inception. Yes, and, this has Inception. Yeah, uh, forgetting one other one as well, but uh, but all fighter, together, a totally different story. I I like this quite a bit. All right, well, for anybody who hasn't seen it, let's let's take a look. Oh, we kind of got in the middle of it, huh? He's hiding something, and we need to find out what that is. Is everybody in there? Huh? The seed that we plant in this man's mind will grow to an idea. This idea will define him. This can't be done. Yes, it can. I've done it before. <laughs> That's the best part. The dream has become the reality for you to say otherwise. Those were not normal projections. His subconscious is militarized. This was not a part of the planet! Anyway, so you get the gist. It's actually a pretty long uh, trailer, uh, but the idea is that Batman uh, is just insane and thinks he's Batman, but he isn't really, and so they go into his mind to fix him. Uh, I, I thought it was I, I thought it was the reverse, that they were trying to make him it believe he was Batman. But I don't know. I mean, that'd be interesting. In fact, you tell us which version you think it is by sending us a letter over at frameratesshow at gmail.com. Which uh, plenty of you did. Uh and we got an email from Zach in Colorado Springs that we'll read in our feedback segment. I just tricked Jammer B. Oh, yeah. No, oh, no, you can't, you can't just go to the, oh, yeah. Redo, redo, redo. Now yes. it's time for feedback with Brian and Tom on Fred. Oh, yeah. 
Zach says, hey, guys, just wanted to let you know that my invite came through from the Zadiva wait list about a month after I heard about it on your show. I signed up, gave him 10 bucks for 10 rentals and got two free. I rented Get Low to try the first one out. Good movie and was pleasantly surprised with the quality. Uh, the opening scene screens are just like you are sticking in a DVD and pushing play. You can set it up initially to skip the previews on the DVD to resume whenever you left off. If you return the DVD. If you pause, you have 60 minutes to push play again before the DVD is returned to be rented out again. The great thing is that you can rewatch any rented movie as many times as you want for 14 days. It is a strange experience at first, but the overall viewing is not very different than Netflix streaming. The choices are nowhere near Netflix's, but very rarely did I ever see a brand new DVD not available for rental. See, it sounds like it sounds like they're running that right. They're 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 legit. I mean, it it does sound like they're doing exactly what they say. Uh, I got two things right here that just popped up. One is a tweet that happened live while we're doing this show. Uh, Mark says, "Okay, even cooler watching Twit Live with Ace Detect and Schwood on frame rate." in flight on Southwest stream everything. How cool is that? That people are actually right now watching us. We talk the, the whole show. We're talking about anything you want, anywhere you want it. And to know that somebody that that's true, even for live content is pretty cool. Mark, if you're still up in the air, <laughs> say that we could really enjoy that. I hope you, I hope you liked it. <laughs> you tricked me, dude. <laughs> We also got another uh, email, uh, video response here from uh, from some folks online. Here hey, we go. guys, I wanted to chime in as a long-term Weird Al fan of the Lady Gaga thing and say that Weird Al is a very classy guy. He bends over backward for his fans, and I wouldn't be surprised at all if those Al fans putting the fire on Lady Gaga did lead to her saying, oh, yeah, it was a manager mix-up. Uh, entirely plausible to me. Oh, and one more thing, Brian. I think it's okay for my kids to hear the parody version of songs first and the real version later. I mean, that's how I grew up, and my doctor says I'm probably not going to kill again. <laughs> that's good to hear. Uh so uh, two things. Number one, I love this. I highly encourage people. If you want to send in, keep it around 30 seconds. We'd love to show your responses or questions live uh, right here on the show. Uh, but specifically what he was talking about for the audio listeners is I tweeted out a while ago that it is a is a cruel, heartless thing to let your kids grow up hearing Weird Al songs not and not know the original songs that they're that they're parroting. And mainly I'm just thinking of, of the embarrassment I had of all those times when it's like, oh, I love the song. I love Rocky Road. Uh, and so it's like, look, just just tell your kids. I mean, let them fall in love with the music, but say, oh, this is a parody of yeah, another this song. This is so not the original. Um, <laughs> I guess it's similar to seeing a movie that's a remake and falling in love with that and then finding out there was a previous version, though. Or or it's a parody of, <laughs> of a movie or well, something. Well, especially if that's a remake like uh, Land of the Lost, and you're like, actually, there was a TV show, and it was totally serious. It didn't have Will Ferrell in it. Uh, yeah, I, I don't even know that that, well, I don't know. Maybe I'm just hating on that movie. <laughs> that doesn't count. Who cares about Land of the Lost? Nobody watched like, that. Nothing important. <laughs> All right. Uh, uh, how about Starsky and Hutch then? Whatever. There you go. Um, there. That's it for this edition of Frame Rate. Thanks, everybody, for watching. Woo! Good to see you guys. You can uh, send us a letter over at uh, frameratesshow at gmail.com. As we say all the time, we do get the chance to read all of them. I even get the chance to respond to most of them. Hit us up with ideas, and, and especially if you guys like the videos we play at the beginning of the show, make sure you hit us up with uh, some suggestions for that as well. Netflix.com slash twit is our sponsor, and we will see you next time on Frame Rate. Bye.